so I had a meeting with a student on Wednesday about some tips, some help for when you're taking a test. And as I went through it with this student, I wanted to, the more I kept talking to her about it, the more I thought if we were in person, I would have said these things probably before the first exam. And I'm just assuming and forgetting that um, some of you are still relatively new to taking science classes, certainly to taking science classes online. And as far as um, clues and sort of like tricks to help you do well on multiple choice tests, because there is an art to it. It's not just a completely random. And the first thing that I wanted to point out to you was that, and I think I said this before, that on all the exams that we take that I generate, and it should be fairly common uh, practice, but it isn't always, you guys have to realize that a couple of things, right? So we teach in college, us college professors, we are not education majors in, in college or in graduate school, we're scientists. And so we usually take pretty seriously how to generate a test, even though we haven't been technically trained in it. There is a, a standard, it's called Bloom's Taxonomy. And it's called Bloom's Taxonomy of Learning, Bloom's Taxonomy, you'll see it called Bloom's Taxonomy of Understanding, of Student Assessment, all different variations, but it's basically the same thing. It's this idea that you can generate objective questions, so that means multiple choice, true, false um, questions, that are of varying levels that can discern between students' uh, level of knowledge their level of understanding and using that knowledge, or we say application. And then the third highest level will be their level of critical thinking. So most of you have probably taken standardized tests before, uh, objective standardized tests like the SAT or the ACT or just um, regular exams that you had to take through high school. And they too are based on Bloom's taxonomy. So if you have some understanding of how the test is formatted, it will help you be able to figure out how to study better and sort of why you got which questions wrong. And so I was gonna ask you guys to take a look at the end of chapter 11 with me. Um, but before we do that, so all about, 70% of an exam is based on the very lowest level of Bloom's taxonomy or level one slash two, which is, do you know the information? Can you recall the knowledge that is necessary to answer this question? So those questions are usually definition type questions. Those questions are um, basic, very basic true false questions. And then the second level is level three, four, apply and analyze. We tend to think of those as the B questions, meaning those are what's gonna separate students who are C students and just know the information from the B students that know the information and can apply it. And then the last type of question of which there are the fewest on the exams, those are the A questions, right? And those are what we would call the highest level of Bloom's taxonomy. And I just, I don't wanna get it wrong because when I learned it 20 years ago, we, it, we learned each one of them one through six. Now they're lumping them together. It's more uh, whatever's in fashion right now. And levels five, six are evaluate and create, which means to try to test your level of critical thinking, meaning you know the information, you know an application of the information, and then can you use it in a new way or can you use it to address a situation that you haven't seen before? And students I tend to say, oh, you mean the trick questions. Those aren't the trick questions. Those are the questions that we're using to figure out, do you really know the information and how to apply it, or do you just know the information? So it helps you to understand a little bit about test design, and it includes all of those things, right? So I do want to um, take a minute and see if I can, <coughs> excuse me. For example, if we, I'm just gonna go to connect real fast and um, go to the book. And I wanted you guys to take a look at the end of chapter 11. I guess it's 
here, sorry. It takes me a minute. There we go, the ebook. Oh yes, the heat just came on my house. Hey, why can't I open the book? There we go. I'm not, I'm not sure. That might help because I think we were looking at chapter, no, it's chapter nine. Oh, well, no, I won't do that to you. Oh, let's look at, um, like I said, let's take a look at chapter 11 in particular. And I want to go all the way to the end of the chapter, the smart grid here. So study harder, study smarter, not harder, right? So that's kind of the um, message here at the end of the chapter, right? Um, either a face to great face study group or a virtual one, right? And ask yourselves these questions, right? Make some concept maps. Um, the student that I was talking with, we had a conversation about that as well. And don't let me forget to bring that back up. Um, the, these chapter summaries are pretty dry and they're pretty um, lean. And again, this is some of the content that I helped write years and years ago. It's changed a little bit over time, but it's it's still pretty easy way if you don't have the note outline or you just have the book with you and you're at work or whatever, you can um, go through the chapter summaries and then I would add the content that we added from class. This is the Bloom's taxonomy that um, I was talking about here and I would like to start with, um, let's see if I can get to the, um, the questions that, I'm re that I really wanted to focus on here. So yeah, so let's take a look at the first one, right? So the concept or the competency that we're looking at for this particular question, these sets of questions is evolution. So we're trying to think about how chapter 11, controlling microbial growth is related to evolution, right? So here, here are the remember and understand. DNA repair mechanisms can help alleviate the effects of UV radiation, alcohol disinfection, autoclaving, dry heat. We mentioned this, I believe, last time I talked about the SOS repair mechanisms in particular. So this is just, do you remember what's in the chapter? I believe the correct answer is A, yeah. Um, this is just, do you remember? Now this is apply and analyze. Explain why all cells in a population do not die instantaneously when exposed to an antimicrobial agent, even when they are of a single species. So this is asking you things about can you add on that the concentration, the um, environment that the organism is in? Like, is it being stirred? Is it on a surface? Can it be penetrated? Is it part of a biofilm? So it's asking you to add some more layers to that, as well as it bearing in mind that we're linking this to the concept of evolution, it would be uh, important here to say things like, um, there, there are mutations in bacteria, and so a chemical might not affect a protein that's been mutated the same way it would affect the native protein. And in a population, some of the proteins in some of the cells are going to be more resistant to the effect of the uh, disinfectant. And then this one, so that's kind of like a B question, right? Like meaning the letter B. If you can answer that question, that's more than just a C question of just telling me, do you remember this information? Level five, six here, triclosan and other antimicrobial compounds have been banned from most consumer products. Explain why we should not be using every chemical available to us to combat microbes. So this now is even a further level. And they want you to first explain a little bit about why triclosan and others have uh, antimicrobial compounds have been banned. And if you remember, if you read through the chapter or if you looked at the notes, it's not only that the bacteria, bacteria are developing resistance to triclosan and these other antimicrobial compounds, triclosan and these other antimicrobial compounds share some chemistry with known antibiotics. And so they not only, it's not only limiting disinfection, but it's also going to be limiting how we can treat humans who have ingested or have inhaled or been exposed to these bacteria. Now we can't use the um, antimicrobial drugs that we would use internally, or, nor can we use the stuff that we're, we would want to use on the surface. And again, if this was actually a question on the test, I, and, I, and you knew 
right? So this has to do with evolution because it has to do with mutations and bacterial populations evolving and their generation time being so short that they can evolve very quickly. And so all of those things would come into this answer, right? Now, that's the same. Your book goes through and gives you an example for each of like a one, two blooms level, a three, four, and a five, six, right? So the one, two levels, these are questions that I would certainly use in that big pool, not these exact questions, but similar questions in that big pool of the 70% of do just know the knowledge. These questions, three, four, and five, six, because of the format that we're in virtually, I'm designing and working on designing multiple choice questions that attack, apply and analyze, evaluate, evaluate and create. And yes, those are harder questions. Those are going to be more difficult. But the more questions in this level, in the easy level, the one, two level that you just know the answers to, the more overall time you have to answer the harder questions as well. Now, this particular exam, there is going to be two parts. The first part is going to be what we've been doing all along. It's going to be objective. And I'm pretty sure it's just all multiple choice, like regular. And then there's going to be a second part, part two, that is going to be due, I believe I worked on it last night, and it's going to be due on Friday. It's going to be open all day on Friday. And that part is a writing part. So it's a short answer section. There are five questions. And you need to pick three. Actually, there's going to be more than that now. Right now, there's uh, five or six, but I'm going to add some more. And those questions, I'm going to be specifically looking for, not that you just tell me wrote the answer, but that you do some of this higher level of Bloom's taxonomy, because that is more time consuming, and it is a higher level of learning, and more what we would expect from students in a 200 level class. So I haven't introduced this from day one, but we're going to introduce it and continue it for the next few sets of exams. So there will be a time limit. It's not just gonna be an all day open-ended forever. There will be a time limit. However, the time limit's rather generous for you to answer three questions. The time limit is, I think it's 25 minutes. So that's more than five minutes each for each question for you to formulate an answer and then type it out in the box. I would expect complete sentences, periods, capital letters. I am quite fond of questions that include things like compare and contrast, where I would ask you to give me a definition for a particular uh, word or concept, and then another definition for a conflicting concept, and then for you to tell me what's similar about them compare and contrast what's different about them. Probably one of the easiest examples I can give you is way back from chapter four, I would say something like compare and contrast gram positive and gram negative cell walls. And I would expect you to first tell me about gram positive cell walls, what they're made up of. Second, comparing them to gram negative cell walls, just give me the definitions. Third, something that's similar, I would expect you to be able to tell me they both contain peptidoglycan and a little bit about what peptidoglycan is, compound complex made of amino acids and um, short peptides and um, modified glucose. And then I would also expect you to be able to tell me another sentence that would just super short, just say the difference, the main difference is where that peptido, the amount and where that peptidoglycan is located in the cell wall. And because that's something we've already learned about, gram positive and gram negative cell walls, that's why I'm using that as an example because it's something that you would already know. Um, and I would expect that, you know, that's like four or five sentences, right? Super concise. Do not just look up some random words on Google that you think are going to match what the answer is and then type that in because I'm not going to give you very much credit for that, if any at all. What I'm looking for is for you to very specifically answer the question that I've asked, right? So you need to read the question really carefully figure out what it is the question's asking you. And then first and foremost, because you'll get partial credit if you do the minimum, which will be somewhat define some terms, identify a concept, right? And then the more points that you'll get of the five points will be 
at 0.4 and 0.5, meaning that 0 0.4, but point number four and point number five will be how well you add clearly um, to the answer to the question that actually answers the question, All right? So that's gonna be a separate quiz. It's gonna be labeled, I think, lecture quiz three, part two. You, some of you have probably already seen it sitting there in the module. And again, how to study for that, I would look at these questions because they are questions as well as some of the questions that they put into um, the virtual groups like these discussion questions. Because if you can explain this to each other or if you can explain it to someone at home, um, then you're gonna actually be able to answer those questions on the test. It's no different than any other type of question. Practice, practice, practice makes perfect. All right, now there was something else that I thought of. What was it? I'm sure I need to question, kind of answer them. The levels of multiple choice question. Oh, I think just, um, oh, I was going to talk a little bit about concept maps. So I'm going to stop this share and add a different share. Um, this is an old, uh, not old, but this is an older concept, an older idea. Let me go back to black here. So a lot of people um, like to use flashcards, for example, when they're studying for this class. And I understand that it's a lot of information and um, you want to be able to recall it very quickly. I get it. Um, I would advise and I'm just gonna simply draw some flashcards here. And those of you that had me for Bio 1, you know this already because I do this for my Bio 1 students all the time as well. I tell them that it's really important to keep your flashcards together. It's not um, a good idea for you to mix them all up, right? So that's basically what a concept map is. A concept map is putting down a concept and then putting all the tendrils, all the flashcards that link to it with that concept and then keeping them together to study. So I'm trying to think of a good example here uh, for chapter 11 that might help us. Sorry. Acknowledging. Blah, blah, blah. Each round we make a list is your concept map man drawing. So, so concept terms. Okay, so your book gives you some concept terms on page 312 there that might form a good um, map, might help you form a good map. I think, um, let's pick, let's pick halogens. Okay. So inside this box here, I'm going to write uh, halogens. And then on the back of that card, of course, I would define the halogens. I would, I, I would identify that it's basically we're talking about chlorine and iodine. And then I would have a separate card for chlorine and its derivatives. And I would maybe put on this card um, the different types of chlorine, chlorine gas, chlorine bleach, um, hypo, hypos chloride, chloramine and then um, what their concentrations are, and then, of course, one for iodine. And then on a separate card, still linked with the chlorine, I would put maybe, I would maybe make three cards. I can think of three different uh, chloramine uh, adaptations. Maybe I would put each of the individual um, types of chlorine. and what they're used for, right? And what they kill. And then same for the iodine, right? So you might have two or three cards just for chlorine. And then the point of the concept map is obviously to make the connections that we're talking about a halogen, we're talking about either chlorine or iodine and its derivatives. And then amongst the chlorine, we might have, again, we might have, and I didn't do a, a bang up job of this, but we might have like three or four cards over here. And I'm making them in red just because it's convenient, right? Whoops. That are all for, all about chlorine. And then we would have a set of cards over here that were all about for iodine. And then collectively, we wanna keep all of these cards about halogens together as a set. And then we might wanna talk about alcohols and have a set for alcohols. 
Um, you notice your book does it. There's different ways to do it. If you would rather, or if you think this would be helpful to you, another uh, that I can think of off the top of my head that came to me when I was just literally writing this one. I need to just add it. Where's my little add a board? There we go. Um, you might choose something completely different, and you might put a card for, um, for example, pills slash sterilize. That's, this is a good, so this is a good way to study sort of after you've memorized the basic material, right? So I might do, uh, for me, I might do a concept map like this, what kills and sterilizes, and then I would have maybe however many cards that is, however many flashcards or however many items, circles you want to draw on a piece of paper, whatever, and then I would list the different chemical and physical methods that kill or sterilize, for example, right? So in here I might put irradiation. And then of course that's going to give me uh, that I'm going to have different types of irradiation, right? So you can see how this just keeps building super easily, right? So then I would want to talk about ionizing radiation and non-ionizing radiation and in this particular, only for my sterilized set, only ionizing radiation would fit. Let me get rid of that last, um, just get rid of that guy, right? So then I would put ionizing radiation, what chemicals can kill, and then I might have four or five cards under there, um, and what um, filtration or mechanical methods can actually sterilize, right? And I would put a few cards under there. And then again, if this is my set on sterilization, then I want to keep this set together. I don't want to I want to keep all these together, right? What agents can kill or sterilize? And remembering, of course, what that means. And then I would make a whole other set for um, which are bacteriostatic, for example, and don't kill or sterilize, but are still useful for disinfection. So it doesn't matter how you put it together. Um, whatever works for you to help you remember is what's important. And then again, it's being able to access all of the things that go with this particular idea or topic, rather than just shuffling all the cards together and having a card about alcohol and then the next card be about radiation. That's not helpful for your brain. It's much harder to memorize things if you scramble them all up than if you keep them in sets because they're connected to each other in your head, which the concept map is all about. And in, in theory, if you can access one of them, right? So if this is, these are chemicals that sterilize, right? But then the question is about irradiation. You're going to go, your brain is going to go to this set in your head. And it's going to be like, oh, not chemicals, not this, but irradiation. What goes with irradiation? And if you study it in this pack, that helps. I have also been told by the psychologists, I've also read papers about this, which is why I keep drawing things in circles, is because for human beings, we are much better at remembering things that are round than things that are square. And people think it has something to do with faces, that we use facial recognition to recognize each other, friends and foes. So again, with the concept map is somewhat linked to that, in that um, the idea, some people make their concept maps like this, they make them in circles, right? They put cards all around the main card. And that's the reason for that. And um, other times, similar to when you guys did Venn diagrams in grade school and high school, right? Things that are the same, things that are different where the crossover is. Circles, we're better at remembering things in circles and squares. So um, I've even had students that have cut their cards circular um, or just put them in uh, groups, and when you lay them out, kind of lay them on a, on a table or something, lay them in a circle, that helps. I get it. If you put all your cards on study blue, that's not helping because it's all digital and they're all just randomly scrambled up one at a time. Try to see if you can do a little more sophistication and keep things in groups, and if you can't, then don't use that. You, you know, change your methods. If you keep studying the same way, you're going to keep getting the same results. Right? If you try something new, it may, you may find that it really helps um, improve your grade. Okay, so that's all I want to say about that. Unless, um, does anybody have any questions or anything to add to that? Let's see, I'll stop the share here. I think I hit all those points, right? Okay, <laughs> that we talked about. 
Um, and sometimes that helps a lot. If you know how to study better, then you study better and then you do better on the test. All right, so that kind of finishes up our chapter 11. Chapter 12, I did want to go over with you real briefly. I'm sure most of you saw that I put up some Connect. Uh, they're short, they're really short uh, because I don't want you to spend a lot of time studying a bunch of stuff in chapter 12 that's not going to be on the test, right? So with that in mind, I thought we could go through the PowerPoints real quickly for chapter 12 which are the same set that I used for spring. I don't know, I was, I found, or yeah, it was spring. I found that I liked a dark background, I don't know, because the room was bright or something. I don't know, I was just trying different things. I thought this looked kind of cool because it stood out a little more than, um, it was easier for me to read because I'm old than if it was white background with black letters. So for whatever reason, this PowerPoint is all in black background. So um, this section here, this long list, ideal characteristics of the antimicrobial drug. So I do want to mention that this whole chapter is about antimicrobial drugs and antimicrobial therapy. We used to call it chemotherapy, and it's still equally correct to call it that. I think because in common terms, we only associate chemotherapy with cancer. That's the reason why they've changed it to antimicrobial therapy. It's not antibiotic therapy because the antibiotic is actually a very specific word that refers to a very small amount of antimicrobial drugs. And if we use the word antimicrobial, then it also will include things that we can, um, fungus we can kill and um, various protists and of course bacteria and inhibiting viruses as well. So this is the list, kind of like we had a list for what an ideal disinfectant was, this is the list for an ideal antimicrobial drug. And you'll see it's very long, right? And no drug meets all of these requirements, just like no chemical met all of the ideal requirements. Ideal, not actual, right? This is what people are striving for. And this is why new antimicrobial drugs are being created all the time, because we still haven't found um, ones that will be toxic to the microbe and not toxic to the host and be cytal, not static, right? Will be reasonably priced, will be easy to make. These are the terms of antimicrobials. I already mentioned chemotherapy, prophylaxis. I know I asked that in the Connect um, as a definition. Antimicrobials, I want to focus on antibiotics because this is the um, most narrow word of the set. Right? An antibiotic is actually a substance that's produced naturally. It's a byproduct. It's something that a bacteria or fungus produces that can inhibit or destroy other microbes. Generally, the term is used for drugs targeting bacteria and not other types of microbes, it's mostly antibacterial. So it's a naturally occurring substance made by a bacteria or fungus that inhibits other bacteria or fungi. And why we put here created by scientists, not really created, but let's say harvested might be a better word there. Um, we grow the bacteria or the fungus, and then we purify the uh, particular agent that we're trying to use as an antimicrobial drug. So I want to briefly, briefly, briefly tell you the story of the first anti antibiotic, right? So the first antibiotic is penicillin. It's the first one that naturally occurring substance produced, actually this one's produced by a fungus, that was used to inhibit or kill bacteria, right? So the discovery of penicillin is credited to a man named Alexander Fleming in 1928, and that just the discovery of, that he could see that there was a mold that was growing on a petri dish and it was inhibiting preventing the growth of the bacteria around it. And he studied it a little bit, but that was about it. He identified the bacteria and he identified the mold and that was it. It wasn't until the early 1930s and then not until the mid 1940s that penicillin was actually produced in enough volume that it could be used on patients. Sadly, the first patient that it was used on, um, his name was Albert Alexander and he is 
affectionately known as the Oxford Bobby, because he was a policeman in England who caught himself shaving and got a really, really wicked staph infection and was hospitalized, eyes swollen shut, couldn't, a huge fever, couldn't eat, barely could drink. And the gentleman, his name was Dr. Flory. He was trying to purify penicillin with some of his colleagues and they purified some penicillin and they tried it on him, literally. They were just like, he's gonna die. Can we just give it to him? And the ethics board of the hospital was like, no, you can't do that. You can't just give this person some random drug that you don't even know if it works. And they were like, well, we tried it on a dog and we tried it on a, a child and they, it worked really well. So we think that it'll work on this guy. So the hospital said, fine, right? He's going to die anyway. So they gave him the penicillin. And the tragic part of the story is they didn't have enough for a, an adult because a full-size man is a lot larger body mass than a child or a dog. So they gave him the penicillin. They didn't have enough to keep, he started to get better. They actually tried to repurify and were successful repurifying the excess penicillin out of his urine and giving it back to him. But they still ran out. And after a mild recovery, he did end up um, succumbing to the infection because it was too, there were too many bacteria. And that was about in 1933-ish, 34. And then um, along comes World War II. And so the production of pharmaceuticals was not a top priority of chemical companies at the time. And so Flory and a man named Chain, who was a, a refugee from Germany, but he was an organic chemist, he um, could purify the penicillin. They actually came to the United States and looked for a pharmaceutical or a drug company, a chemical company basically, that would grow the fungus and purify the penicillin. And they found that in uh, Indianapolis at Eli Lilly and they grew tons and tons of penicillin. And then the first clinical trial for the penicillin on a large scale was actually um, in 1945 on soldiers who had wounds from the war. So um, at that time, again, it was still all naturally occurring. So it is, was truly an antibiotic. Today, most of us that have taken penicillin have not taken naturally occurring penicillin. We have taken what um, your book is going to call a, excuse me, uh, semi-synthetic, I'm looking to see, here we go, synthetic or semi-synthetic, so a penicillin that's been modified or completely non-naturally occurring, would be completely synthetic. And then these two words, of course, we want to add in narrow spectrum, meaning they're only going to kill a certain um, part of the, -micro of the microbial growth in this case, like an example. A drug that only works on gram positive bacteria as opposed to a broad spectrum, which will kill many different kinds of bacteria. The advantage for a broad spectrum is that it may work very quickly, but its efficacy usually wears off because it's usually so general that it won't kill all of the gram positives or all of the gram negatives. So here are just some examples. And again, I'm not going to ask you what is the range of streptomycin, what does it kill? That's not the point of me showing you this. The point of me showing you this is that some drugs have a very narrow spectrum, right? This one even smaller, this one even smaller, and others, like look at tetracycline, that's because it inhibits protein synthesis. But look, it will kill gram negatives, gram positive, chlamydias, and rickettsias, right? This is also an interesting addition to the figure are there normal microbiota in this group? So that means, are there bacteria that you will also be killing that are normal flora that are normally helping you um, keep away infections, right? So that usually means the side effects back here to the toxic to the microbe, but not the host, right? And does not lead to resistance and does not cause allergy or predisposing the host to other infections, right? Those broad, um, and some of those broad spectrum antibiotics are more likely to do those things. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, now let's take a look at this picture because um, again, it's not important for you to memorize all the names of the drugs. What's important, what I'm gonna ask you about are questions based on the mode of action. And for antibacterial drugs, we're gonna go through antibacterial, antifungal, antiprotozoan, and antiviral drugs. 
for antibacterial drugs, there are five modes of action here. Ones that inhibit protein synthesis, um, the folic acid synthesis inhibitors, cell wall cell inhibitors, cell membrane, um, dam they damage the cell membrane, and then of course, drugs that inhibit um, replication, transcription, replication and transcription. So I've got these written out for you. And um, this is purposely very vague because I expect you to take some notes, read your book, think about this stuff, right? Inhibitors of cell wall synthesis or repair, write down as many specifics as you can remember about bacterial cell walls, about the structure of gram-positive and gram-negative cell walls, about the structure and the compounds in acid-fast bacterial cell walls. Nucleic acid synthesis inhibitors of pretty much all the enzymes you can remember about replication and transcription. Inhibitors of the cell membrane, those usually have to do with permeability. Um, a lot of times they affect um, the sterols in the cell membrane. The folic acid synthesis inhibitors, that's super specific. It's one metabolic pathway. And I don't think I have it all um, written out for you, but probably in your textbook. It's a single, folic acid is the basis for several amino acids and as well as amino acids that can be turned into pyrimidines and purines. So it's super important. And bacteria produce their own folic acid. Animals do not, we eat our folic acid. So this is an example of a super selective toxicity. It will only affect the bacteria and not the people. But we share so many metabolic pathways with bacteria, question about evolution, um, that this is the only one we have so far that is super specific and a big difference between bacterial metabolism and animal metabolism in terms of cellular metabolism. And then the ones that inhibit uh, protein synthesis. And I think I've included those here. Um, there's five mechanisms for um, drugs to inhibit protein synthesis. And I put this on here, right, tongue in cheek. Oh, would you look at that? They relate to the five steps of translation that you learned for the last exam. Right? So if you remember about translation, about the message binding to the small subunit of the ribosome, about the large subunit binding to the message and that small subunit, about the first transfer RNA filling the P site, the second transfer RNA filling the A site, and then the ribosome moving over, you'll see that the drugs that we have block, each block different parts of those, of those five steps. So here's a group that block the large subunit from binding. Here's a group that cause the messenger RNA to um, sort of have a wiggly line so that the transfer RNAs are read, the, yeah, the message is misread. Here's one that blocks the filling of the A site or the peptide bond from being formed. Here's one that blocks the A site. And then here's one that blocks the moving of the ribosome over. Right? And if you look down this list, I would say most of you have probably already taken aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, or erythromycins, or some combinations of those in your short lifetimes that you already have. Right, so if you go through and you think about all of the unique parts of bacteria or not unique parts of bacteria, so in this case, enzymes involved in replication, try to remember that the DNA polymerases and the RNA polymerases are different in bacteria compared to animals. There is some specificity there. And then for protein synthesis, we listed them all out. Okay, um, drugs that will treat fungal infections, listed four major groups here. I'm not gonna go through each one of them. You can read about them. You can read this table. It's the same table that's Fungal drugs are a little bit more difficult to treat. Uh, fungus infections, fungal infections are a little more difficult to treat. And pretty much that is based on the fact that fungus are eukaryotes and you are a eukaryote. So it's more difficult to find unique compounds between you and the fungus or unique metabolism between you and fungus. Because we're actually more closely related to fungus than we are to bacteria, so at least we're both eukaryotes. You'll notice that um, the azoles here, for example, right, and the echinocandins, they both, I believe, uh, affect so cell wall synthesis. So they're gonna affect the sterols there. And these guys, I used to know 
that off the top of my head, but I don't anymore. And you'll notice that I think in your textbook, some of them can't really tell you what their action is, it's kind of vague. Right. So I'm looking real quick here. There's, um, but this table is purple in your uh, current edition of your textbook, and it looks just the same, except um, these are actually called uh, alliamines. So we have the macro, macrolide polyenes, the azoles, the echinopandins, and these are the ones that inhibit ergosterol. No, actually, they've taken this one off the list. So I should strike that one out because it's no longer um, on the list. I don't think I uh, can't do that, but I'll try to um, add the alliamine. All right. Now, the drugs that affect uh, anti that inhibit viruses, they focus on three main modes of action. So the first one is uh, get the virus getting in. The second is how the virus um, is multiplied, particularly focusing on the RNA or DNA replication or transcription. And then the last one is how the virus releases from the host cell. So if we take a quick look here, um, there aren't very many drugs that can block the entry and they are specific to specific viruses. And the reason for that, of course, is going to be because You'll remember in animal viruses, the virus binds to a specific receptor on a specific type of cell, right? So this is a terrible picture from the perspective that we're showing you HIV entering a cell and flu entering the same cell because they usually do not. So influenza virus would be entering cells in the respiratory system and HIV, of course, would be entering cells in the lymph system. But they would be binding to their uh, specific receptors and basically what happens is we have drugs that block those receptors so that or coat the virus so the virus can't fuse with its receptors and then the virus can't get in. The difficulty with these drugs that block entry is you have to be treated with them prior to when you're actually sick, right? So if we look here at um, Tamiflu, for example, that's only useful if you have the flu and you get the Tamiflu fairly when you have a symptom or you know that you've been exposed, and then it's actually better for your contacts than it is for you because it can help them um, because they're not sick yet. Probably the biggest group of modes of action are those drugs that can inhibit nucleic acid synthesis. If we can prevent the virus from replicating or copying itself, then we can prevent the virus from causing an infection. So again, you'll notice that they tend to be rather virus specific and that depends on how the virus replicates. If it's a double-stranded DNA virus, a single-stranded RNA virus, um, an RNA virus that comes with reverse transcriptase, or um, this is a different kind of, um, these are both HIV drugs. So one of them is what we call, these are called nucleoside or nucleotide analogs. And you'll see that we have purine ones as well as uh, these two here. Let's focus on these two. So they imitate purines, remember, would be A and G. They are false adenines and guanines. And the enzymes of replication, so DNA polymerase, is going to grab onto them by mistake. And when it puts them in, some of them are chain terminating. So this guy, acyclovir, here is a chain terminating. And so what that means is, when the enzyme, the DNA polymerase, grabs the drug instead of the correct base and it inserts it across from the complementary DNA, it causes DNA polymerase to stop. So the virus can't replicate, then of course it can't set up an infection. These drugs, these three or four are also nucleotide um, inhibitors, uh, analogs, that work particularly well blocking reverse transcriptase, which is an enzyme that HIV brings with it, these blue dots here, along with its RNA. And reverse transcriptase is just like it sounds. It's a 
basically an RNA dependent uh, DNA polymerase. So it converts RNA, reverse transcribes, instead of so normal transcription is DNA to RNA, reverse transcription, taking the RNA genome and converting it into DNA, which can then become a provirus. So if we can block that, then it can't become a provirus and can't permanently infect a person. And then the last set are inhibiting viral release, and this is a little more complicated. Um, these are protease inhibitors. And so I think I'm going to go to a, stop this share, and go to a whiteboard and draw that one out for you. So let me clear this nonsense. Um, so with the protease inhibitor, it's a little bit of a longer discussion, right? So I'm just going to write a few things here. So protease is a general term for an enzyme that um, breaks apart proteins, right? And we know that viruses require a capsid, right? They require a protein coat of some sort, right? The capsid, which is made out of protein. So the idea is normally many viruses, when they are in their synthesis um, stage, they produce long proteins that need to be cut into pieces to be functional. And a great example of that is GP120 in uh, HIV virus, okay? So GP120 is a really long protein that gets cut into uh, GP40 and, oh, sorry, it's GP160, sorry. GP160 gets cut into GP uh, glycoprotein, that's what the GP stands for, 40 and GP120. And those are both proteins that are involved in making the capsid. Okay, so GP160 here um, needs to be cut by, guess what, a protease. So that's like the basic part. And so if I have a chemical that can inhibit a protease, right? You see that then I can prevent um, the normal virus um, protein sizes necessary for assembly. And if I can't assemble, then I can't release uh, then no infection, right? No spread. So for viruses, the best um, or antiviral therapy, the best is if you have a combination of one that blocks entry, one that inhibits um, nucleic acid synthesis, right? So I have to say that because viruses, some are DNA, some are RNA viruses, so it inhibits either transcription or replication, and then a third one that inhibits release. And this is like the gold standard, right? So all of these drugs that you're seeing um, advertised on TV for HIV that are sort of maintenance drugs, that's what they are. They're a combination of all three of those different types of drugs. And the reason there's different ones is because different pharmaceutical companies or chemical companies have manufactured different things that block entry, things that block uh, replication, and things that block release. Okay, so that's enough about viruses. The last little bit, um, I do want to spend a little time on this because we um, aren't going to be able to do this lab 
Oh wait, we should talk a little bit about um, anti protozoan and anti helminthic chemotherapy. Um, rather limited, again, because they are more uh, similar to you, eukaryotic, and more complex. The anti-malarial drugs, I've just listed quinine here and derivatives of quinine that are less toxic. Um, they work. Uh, there, are, there is resistance to uh, naturally occurring quinine. The challenge is that if you live in a place, an endemic area where you're going to get reinfected, um, you can get all the treatment you want, but as soon as you're better again, you will, if you get reinfected, obviously then you're going to have to have more treatment, and this can be an endless cycle that's hard to break. Chemotherapy for other protozoan infections, um, I've listed some here. Uh, you can read through them in your book, and I think on, the, on a handout that I have about this that I'll post. Um, basically, most of these either inhibit nucleic acids or they cause paralysis. I believe these two. I know ivermectin causes paralysis and so does the praziquantel. You may have rec you may recognize these because you've probably given them to your kittens or puppies um, because they get worms usually from snuffling through or gnawing on someone else's feces, right? And again, same thing, you can be treated for some for helminths, but if you get re-exposed and you get another infection, then you're going to have to be treated again, right? Because these are these are drug therapies; they're not um, immune therapies. Now, how um, particularly antibacterial drugs are tested is uh, this is the classic method. It's called the Kirby-Bauer disc diffusion test, and I do think it's important that you see this because it shows you very clearly that you have these, um, so you put a lawn, you put bacteria from a patient, you spread it all over the Petri dish, and then you deposit these filter papers that are perfectly round and have been impregnated with a one concentration of drug, and you evenly space them, and then you measure this zone of inhibition, we call it, and it's measured in millimeters, and then you use this chart and you look at your measurement and your drug or all of the drugs and you can evaluate whether or not this bacteria is intermediate sensitive or resistant. If the bacteria is sensitive that means it will be killed or inhibited by this drug. If it's resistant obviously you shouldn't use that one. Now one of the main disadvantages of, the cur of doing the Kirby Bauer doing the disk diffusion test is that you must have the chart that goes with it. You must have this um, drug table and they're produced every six to nine months by the um, American Association of Clinical Microbiologists because um, resistance changes over time and it's different actually in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. So just because the um, drug diffuses really well does not necessarily mean that it is going to be the best drug of choice. So let's see if we can um, quickly come to an example here. So if we look at the penicillin, um, this is naturally occurring penicillin, so we need a zone greater than 29 millimeters. And if we look where penicillin is on our example, of course it's not on the example. All right, let me try a different one. Nope. What about, yeah, so these are lab results like from a teaching lab. Most of these things aren't ones that people use anymore. So I guess I can't give you an example, but I'll just say this. The disdiffusion, we can't distinguish bacteriostatic from bacteriocidal because the um, drugs diffuse through the media at different speeds depending on whether they are, or different rates, depending on whether they are water soluble or lipid soluble. And we're only testing a single dose here of each drug. So an improvement on the Kirby Bauer is something called the E-test. And this is a good example. This is a blood agar plate. And you see how you can see this um, sort of um, elliptical shape here. This strip has different amounts of drug. So you can still can't tell um, from cytal, but you can tell what concentrations the drug is effective and is not effective. 
right? And again, you would measure this zone and you would have a chart that would be similar to this that would give you an indication of what concentration you would have to use. Much better are um, tube dilution tests and they can be done actually in full test tubes or this is a micro titer plate. This um, micro titer plate that's over here with the 12 uh, rows, right? Yeah, 12 rows and like eight columns. So it, it's only about this big. It's plastic and it holds, when you tip it like this, it holds each of those little tiny wells. You're looking at, at it down from the top. But if you look at it from the side, it's like 96 little miniature test tubes are in one of these plates and you can, it holds 300 microliters. So you can easily use this to test really quickly lots and lots of drugs. Notice here we're testing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven drugs, and we're testing them at initial concentration and in decreasing concentrations or maybe increasing concentrations. The picture I think is preferred. Um, take a quick look in your book at the, um, I think your book puts this stuff at the beginning of the chapter. So I'm going to flip back to the first few pages here. Yep, so this is panel B of figure 12.3 and pink indicates growth, blue indicates no growth. So yes, pink indicates growth, blue indicates no growth. So I think the, the highest concentration of the drug was started over here and it was diluted across the plate. So where the X's are indicate the first well that the bacteria is actually killed. This is useful because now we can actually tell cidal from static and we can tell at what concentration. And this is useful information because we always wanna use the minimum inhibitory concentration because we can detect it and then that will be less likely to cause the development of resistance. So that's just a summary of this. And this, these petri dishes, these, um, sorry, these micro titer plates can actually be read in a spectrophotometer. So we can actually count or make a control and then we can be sure that where these X's are placed actually indicates dead cells. Uh, three factors before starting, identify the organism, degree of the susceptibility and the overall medical condition of the patient because if someone's allergic to a particular drug or of course if they are also having liver problems or kidney problems, there's some drugs that we can't use because they won't be cleared as well. The last section is about how resistance develops. And um, I want to be really clear that this has multiple parts, okay? The first, this part here is how, like the, the three mechanisms that happen in a bacterial population to cause resistance. Spontaneous mutation, horizontal transfer, so genes moving by conjugation, transformation, or transduction, or transposons, and then sharing of this, right? Gene transfers are extremely frequent in nature, in, like, meaning like out in the wild, um, but they increase substantially when your the organisms are all inside, all the bacteria are inside a single organism, like you as a person. Now, this picture, so this is how the resistance develops. These are sp some specific mechanisms of drug resistance, meaning molecularly what's happening that the drugs are no longer functional. So by these methods, there can be, by mutation, there can be a mutation to an enzyme that literally destroys the active portion of the drug which is what happened in the case of penicillin. There are several enzymes that bacteria produce now that break this beta-lactam ring, which is the active portion of penicillin. There are also mutations or a spread of a mutation through horizontal transfer of permeability changes, meaning the drug could bind to a particular protein receptor and got taken into the cell 
and the receptor has been mutated and now the drug doesn't bind. Or it, it binds, but the, it can't get in to its target site. This is a, a lovely one and it's pretty common in bacteria. They actually um, co-opt one pump that was used for something else and they just literally pump the drug back out so it never reaches its target. The binding sites of the target get changed. So that means like the shape of the ribosome so that the drugs that are trying to bind and block, like for example, trying to bind and block the assembly of the ribosome or block filling the A site, if the ribosome has been mutated in a bacteria through spontaneous mutation, and then that mutation has been spread around to all the neighbors and friends of that bacteria of the same species, we can easily get drug resistance. And then this is one that's rare, but still works. Remember, we only have the folic acid inhibitors. And in this case, the bacteria has an alternate pathway that it can use if the main pathway to make folic acid, for example, is shut down by an inhibitor. And then the other really important concern is the things that humans do that increase antimicrobial resistance. I like to call them the stupid human tricks. And this is just stuff that we do that um, increases, like I said, increases bacterial resistance to the medications that we have. So most of the prescriptions that are given um, are based actually for viral infections and an antimicrobial drug will not help at all. Um, the shotgun approach, meaning we're just gonna give you a big dose and what we, based on what we think it is before there's been any assessment like a Kirby Bauer or a broth dilution test. Hospitals are an environment that continually exposes pathogens to a variety of drugs and healthcare workers transmit them to from patient to patient. And the more drugs a pathogen is routinely exposed to, the more likely it will develop resistance to all of those drugs. Um, having drugs in animal feed, this has decreased substantially in the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years in that um, for a while, it, antimicrobial drugs were being, human antimicrobial drugs were being used to help prevent salmonella in chickens. And then it would turn out that we were actually developing salmonella resistance to the drugs. And then people were eating that chicken and they were getting multi-drug resistant salmonella from eating contaminated chicken. So that has actually gone down with the decrease of using Anti, uh, antimicrobials in animal feed and worldwide travel because, well, not right now, but because normally we can move from country to country and place to place, we take all of our resistant infections with us wherever we go. And then we easily transmit them to other parts of the world where maybe there wasn't resistance before. Future, current and future approaches to combating the drug resistance. Um, bacteriophage, still people would love to use bacteriophage because it targets just the bacteria, not the host. Um, difficulty in getting enough, a large enough dose, although there's always work, you can always find papers about bacteriophage. Using molecular inhibitors that go directly after like CRISPR, for example, or an antisense RNA, or some of those other regulatory RNAs that directly only attack the bacterial messenger RNA so that it can't copy itself so the bacteria would die. And then I've listed prebiotics, probiotics, and bacterial transfers. So probiotics, those of course are bacteria that you ingest on purpose to help maintain particularly um, gut bacteria. And bacterial transfers, this is pretty common now with C. diff, uh, Clostridium difficile, in that you can actually transfer feces from a healthy person in, because C. diff is not very robust. And if you reintroduce normal flora into a person who has serious drug resistant C. diff, you can actually give them a fecal transplant and it will repopulate their intestine with healthy bacteria in a way that can't be done with uh, probiotics or prebiotics. And it's actually quite successful. Uh, I just made a list of some of the Organs that get targeted, uh, toxicity. Of course, the liver and the kidneys are gonna be number one because they do so much filtering for you. Um, excess antimicrobials are tough on the kidneys because you have to just excrete them. And some of the byproducts get stored in the liver and can actually cause liver damage. 
um, just sort of generic effects, common adverse effects, uh, diarrhea, and then I also listed a little bit about allergy. Right. Okay, so that is the end of chapter 12. I'm going to end that recording because it's